Thank you for joining us today for this life-changing message from River of Life. If you are ever in our area, we would love for you to join us. For more information, visit us at rolcrawfordville.com. That's rolcrawfordville.com. Or download our app in the App Store under ROL Crawfordville. Now, let's join Derek Gray as he teaches from the Word of God. If you're visiting with us tonight or or watching online for the first time, I want to welcome you to our uh, Wednesday night River of Life uh, Bible study. Uh, We are making our way through the book of James. And uh, tonight, we are going to be once again in James 121. Um, which the more time I spend in it, I'm coming to see this is probably one of the greatest verses uh, in the Bible, uh, without a doubt. And the title of our lesson tonight is Receiving God's Word. So let's read our verse. It says, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls. Now, um, we're going to go through, I I told you last week, uh, we spent two weeks here on this verse, and I told you last week that I'm going to go through it in detail tonight. But before I do, I want to revisit once again this phrase that we find in this verse, the implanted word. And the reason I'm doing that, because this phrase is only used by James. You will not find, you will not find these particular words in any other uh, place in the Bible. James is the only one that uses it. So I want to make sure we understand before we move on what he means by that. Now, I I said last week, and I'm going to reiterate this again, if you are here tonight and you are a believer, you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then I think it is absolutely imperative that you understand how you came to be who you are, because it is an absolute miracle that you are what you are. In, in, in 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25, he said this, you have been, talking to people who have, are believers, he says, you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, not, not of seed which can rot and die away and, 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 and never to be seen again, not that kind of seed, but a seed that is imperishable or incorruptible, that cannot be destroyed, that cannot die, that cannot stop producing. And, and what is that seed? He says, the living and abiding word of God. And he says, this word is the good news that was preached to you. So here's what we learned last week. Peter says, God saved us through his word. And he did that through the work of the spirit. We, again, please, if you, have, if you weren't here last week, go back and listen to that lesson. But what the spirit does is the spirit comes and enables us to somehow value that message appropriately, to to see the message of the cross appropriately, not to look at it as something moronic, something stupid, something foolish, but to all of a sudden see the gospel as the most beautiful thing we've ever seen in our life. That takes a work of the Spirit. And if you're here tonight and, and you are a born again believer, then the Spirit did that for you. In fact, He did for us what He did for a lady named Lydia. In Acts chapter 16, Paul is, is preaching down by the river, and there's, there's a group of women that are listening to him. And, it's, and, and Luke records this. He says, One of them was Lydia from Thyatira. And as she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart. And she accepted what Paul was saying. Now, you'll remember in 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. So how is it that Lydia accepted when others cannot? It's the work of the Spirit. God has to do that. And, And if you're here tonight and you're born again, that means the Spirit did that for you. He opened your eyes. He opened your ears. He, he lifted the blindness so you could see the gospel for what it truly is. And, and when he did that, you and I believed. We believed what we heard. We believed the message of the cross that was preached to us. And in fact, what we did is we put our faith in the one the message is all about, Jesus Christ. And so we are here today, and we are believers. What an incredible thing to be called a believer, to be called a child of God. But that is who we are. Now, the question becomes this. 
God used the word to save us, but now what do we do with the word? Is it okay just to, to, to stick the word in the drawer in your nightstand and shut it and never need it again? Is that what the word, has it done, has it, has it done its job and we don't need it anymore? Well, the answer to that is an absolute no. No. In fact, the same spirit who used the word to save you, that same spirit will now use that same word to nurture you and guide you and grow you and sanctify you and purify you and discipline you. I mean, that's, the word is, is going to play a huge role in our life. Listen to this scripture, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. So he's, he's describing salvation there. You heard the message, you heard the word, you accepted it, that took the spirit. And, and, and now watch what he says, that word which is at work in you believers. So Paul says the work, now that you're born again, the word is at work in you. John says this in 1 John 2, 14, I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So, so, so um, Paul describes it as being the word is at work in you. John describes it as the word abides in you or lives in you. This is how James describes it. He says the word is implanted in you. Some translations say engrafted in you. So he's talking about the same thing as Paul, and he's talking about the same thing as John. But the word is now, and I love the way he puts it. That is a beautiful explanation. Because what he's saying is the word is now a part of us. You see, we're born again by the word. And, and when that happened, the word, a love for the word, a, a submission to the word, that was implanted like a seed inside of us. And now it becomes, it's in us, it's, it's a part of us. By the way, it's exactly what God said he would do in Jeremiah 31, 33. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. You see, in the Old Testament, the law was out here. It was written on tablets, it was written on scrolls. And, and, but now, guess what? It's in us. It's implanted in us. It's engrafted in us. It actually becomes a part of our new nature. We, we now have the ability to follow it and submit to it and, and obey it. So the question becomes, how does a genuine faith react or relate to that implanted word? Well, James 121 is going to answer that question for us tonight. Um, here's, I'm going to bring up three things. Here's the first one that we see. Putting off precedes putting something on. Let me say it again. It, before you put something on, you have to take something off. Now, you know, I'm not a gardener. My wife loves to garden and plant, and she's got all that kind of stuff. I don't really have any of that. Um, but, but anybody that's ever planted a plant understands that you've got to give it some care, right? You've got to do something. Um, even, if, even if you just set it out there in a pot or something, and it got plenty of rain, and it got plenty of sun, the fact is, if you don't weed it, if you don't tend it, if you don't take care of it, the, the, the weeds are just going to, the briars, the thorns, whatever, are just going to grow up around it, and they're going to choke the life out of it. This is what Jesus talks about, that, by the way, in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. He says, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. But still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was what was sown. You see, in the same way that you have to take care of a plant that's growing and you want it to produce fruit, you got to water it, you got to fertilize it, you got to tend to it. In the same way, you and I have to tend to the soil of our heart where the seed of the word is growing. That's our responsibility. Now, let me explain this. For those of you that have become Christians, um, you know that you brought baggage. How many of y'all brought a lot of baggage? We all did. When you come to, into the kingdom of light, when, you, when you're translated, as, as the scripture says, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, buddy, you, you come with a whole bunch of suitcases, a whole bunch of, of baggage. And what happens is you begin to read God's word. And all of a sudden, there's some things you've got in your life, and you're, you're reading God's word, and you're realizing, man, that's, that doesn't please God. 
God doesn't want that in my life. He wants me to get rid of it. Now, when that happens, you and I have a choice. We always have a choice. We can, we can choose to put aside those filthy clothes that we brought in and put on brand new clean ones that represent a life in Christ. We can put off the old and we can put on the new or we don't. That's your choice. Now, let me tell you something. Pastor Henry and I were talking about this today. In the end, you're going to choose one or the other. You're going to choose the old or the new. You have to. Let me, let me think about it this way. If you're a person and you got all this baggage in your life and you open and you say, man, I'm going to start reading the Bible. And you open the Bible on day one and all of a sudden everything you see there is just convicting the life out of you. Everybody ever been there? It's just like, man, this, this ain't good. So you go tomorrow and you, you turn somewhere else in day two and you read and guess what? It's convicting you again. And the days go by and the months go by. And every time you open the Bible, it just keeps speaking conviction to your lifestyle. Conviction to your lifestyle. Conviction to your lifestyle. Let me tell you, folks, there ain't a lot of joy in that kind of Bible reading. There's not a lot of satisfaction in that kind of Bible reading. It's just a bunch of conviction. And let me tell you, that'll get old. And if that continues to happen, because guess what? You're not putting it away. The Bible's convicting you. Instead of you taking off that behavior or taking off that action, you just just leave it there. If you continue to do that and you don't put away the old, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to eventually reach a point where you just get tired of it. You get tired. You say, I believe this, but then your behavior doesn't match up. Eventually, you've got to choose one or the other. You just can't live like that. That's not a joyous Christian life. You, you're going to be like, man, I don't... So which one are you going to do? And let me tell you, I think you've got to make a choice, and the most likely choice is you're going to make is you're going to jettison the Bible. You're going to jettison your beliefs, and you're going to hold on to your behaviors. Why do I say that? Because you've been holding on to them for months. When the Bible keeps speaking conviction to your life, you just hold on to them because you're friends with them. You've made beds with and You're in bed with it. You've accommodated it. It's a part of your life. And you don't want to get rid of it. And, and eventually, eventually, most people will just jettison the Bible and say, okay, this is, this is who I am. But let me tell you, true believers will do just the opposite. True believers will do what James is telling us to do. We will lay aside the moral filth. We will lay aside the evil and the wickedness, and we'll take the word. We'll take the word. That's what true believers do. In fact, this is, this, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. One of the things that James is doing, and he's going to continue to do, is give us tests to see whether or not you are a true believer. And this is one of the tests. A true believer, when, when they're convicted, they will lay aside what God is convicting them about. They'll put it aside, and they'll choose the Word. They'll choose God. And this is what He's encouraging us to do. Now, I want to walk through this verse, and we'll start with the putting away. James 1.21. Therefore, He says, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. By the way, this same pattern is taught throughout the Bible. This isn't just James. This is, uh, this is 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2. Watch what he says. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. And like a newborn infant, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. Paul says, cast off the darkness and put on the light. There's this, there's this idea all throughout Scripture of taking off and putting on. Putting off or casting off precedes putting something on. Now that word put away is important. It literally means to, to take off, to lay aside, or to get rid of. Now why is that important? That term in the Greek was used of, uh, it, it, this year is the Olympics, right? Didn't I see that advertised somewhere? Uh, The Olympic Games, I'm I'm sure you know that, started way back with the Greeks, right? Those guys that ran the the races back then, they would literally take off all their clothes and run naked. Thank God they don't do that anymore, right? But but that's what they did. Because they, they didn't want anything to encumber them. 
anything to stop them from running as fast as they can and as far as they could. That's the term, that they would cast away their, their clothing. By the way, it's the same thing the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside, it's the same word, lay aside every encumbrance, every sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Listen, here's the point. Paul doesn't say, try to restrain it. Uh, Paul doesn't say, try to get a control over that evil. No, you got to get rid of it like a, sh- a snake shedding its skin. You, you don't, you don't, you know, how crazy would it be if you took it all off and just put it in your backpack and carried a backpack? You, that's, you know, some people, that's what they do. They just put it, pull it on the backpack, but it's, they still got it. They, they can put it back on whenever they want to. Paul says, cast it aside, get rid of it, lay, lay it aside completely. Leave it behind. Now, what is he asking us to leave behind? The first thing is all filthiness, and that's exactly what that word means. Now, Paul's not talking about dirt. He's talking about moral filth. He's talking about moral filth. I was thinking the other day, I've got a tractor at home, and um, I, you know, it's a diesel tractor, and, and I, I can tell you, uh, invariably, I will spill diesel on myself, right? And if anybody here has ever spilled diesel or gas on yourself, you'll know that you got to get rid of that thing quick, right? Nobody, I, you know, I never, in fact, I, 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 before I've gone back in the house and just walked through the house and Kathy will come in and say, who spilled, who spilled gas? Because you can smell it, right? You certainly wouldn't sit down at the dinner table with a, with a shirt stained because you couldn't even be able to enjoy your food. You couldn't be able to enjoy anything because of that stench that's in your nostrils. Folks, the same way, moral filth is a stench. And you cannot understand the Word of God. You can certainly not value and see the beauty in the Word of God. You cannot taste and see that the Word is good when you're stained with moral filth. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons so many professing Christians in the, in the church are, don't read their Bible. They don't study their Bible. They don't meditate on their Bible. Because they're just stained with moral filth. And, and, and what James is saying is put it aside. Put it aside. All forms of moral filth must be renounced, given up, and excised from our life. You don't, you don't control it. You don't restrain it. You get rid of it. Now, he adds another term. He says, get rid of, cast away, lay aside all uh, filth and rampant wickedness. Now, this is, a, um, this is an interesting word, the word for rampant there. The word is Parisian. It means superabundant, beyond measure, surplus, exceedingly great. Interestingly enough, this word is used by Paul to describe grace. Isn't that awesome? Romans 5, 17, For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant, there's the word, superabundant, exceedingly great provision of grace, and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. So it's a word to describe when something you just got way more than you'll ever need. James says, put aside the rampant wickedness or evil. Now, what does James mean by that? Well, let me tell you, I think he means two things. Number one, he, he means quantity. Wickedness is super abundant. Sometimes, I, I think as Christians... We walk with Christ for a period of time, and maybe we got rid of the pornography. Maybe we got rid of the alcohol. Maybe we, we, we got rid of the immoral sexual things going on in our life and other stuff. And we think, man, I'm all cleaned up. No, you're not. Evil is super abundant. You should never, as a Christian, I don't care if you're 8 or 87, you'll never get to a place where you don't need any more to come off. Understand that. You keep reading the Word, God will keep showing you things in your life you had no idea were even there. Just keep reading. He'll show you. He'll show you attitudes you didn't understand. He'll show you things that you just thought, I mean, I didn't even know that was there. I didn't know I was doing that. So absolutely, wickedness is super abundant. But I also think he means it in the, in the area of quality. You see, I just said something a while ago that I don't think God believes. 
See, we tend to think, oh, I got rid of the pornography, I got rid of the uh, sexual immorality, I got rid of the alcohol, I got rid of the big things. Now I just need to deal with the little things. You see, I th- when he says rampant wickedness, exceedingly great wickedness, one of the things he wants us to know is there's no such thing as a lesser evil. God don't like none of it. He don't want any of it in our life. He wants it all gone. So yes, there's a lot of it, but we can't, you know, I I just think we have this tendency in our nature to kind of weigh things out. This is worse than that. God wants it all gone. He wants it all put aside. To do what? And here's, we talked about a little bit about this last week. Here's the big phrase in the middle of this. Receive with meekness the implanted word. Let's read that verse again. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. Now, we reviewed this last week in case you weren't with us, because this is an odd thing that he's telling us to do. He's telling you to receive something you already have. You've already got the word implanted in you. It's already engrafted. It's part of you now. It's written on your hearts. And then Paul says, receive it. What does he mean by that? Well, the analogy that we came up with is we kind of took a look at the human body. And what we said is the implanted word is not like your heart. You know, you think about your heart, you're born with it, um, and uh, you just get up every day and it beats, does its job, you lay down at night, it keeps doing its job, you never have to get involved, it doesn't ask you to do anything, it doesn't, ask, it doesn't require anything from you. It's just, it's just there. That's not how the word is. The word is more like oxygen in our body. You know, even now as I'm speaking, even as you're listening, you're, you're breathing and oxygen is in your body. It's a part of you right now. It's, it's in your blood. It's carrying uh, everything that's needed to all parts of your body. It's giving you life. But even as it does, it gives you the ability to breathe again and breathe again. So you just keep receiving it, keep receiving it, and life keeps growing and growing and growing. You see, that's how the Word is inside of us. It is in us. It's implanted in us. It gives us life. And let me tell you, when the Word gives you life, I'm I'm here to say you want more of it. You want more of it. You want more of it. That's one of the ways you can know that you're born again, that you're a believer, when you want more of the Word. What you know is not enough. I'm ready to go on. I just, I need more of that. So I want you to think about that because that's a, that's a, God has done something for us through the Spirit. He is, he, we are born of the Spirit, born again. The Word is implanted in us at, at our new birth. Yet it is our responsibility to continue to receive it, to continue to receive it, just like we're doing here uh, tonight. By the word, by the way, let me just point out that word receive means welcome. Because I'm sure some of you have received things you didn't want, right? Um, you know, when the, the tax notices and stuff arrive, you receive them, but you don't want them. You certainly don't welcome them. This means to receive in a welcoming way, okay? It's the same word, by the way, used in Acts 17.11 to describe the Bereans. It says, now those Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. That's the same word. So you're receive, when he says receive it, it's, it, you're welcoming it in. Not as an enemy, not as somebody that's trying to, something that's trying to control you. You are welcoming it as a, a friend. How do we welcome it? He says with meekness. I was talking to somebody over at dinner tonight about this word. It's the Greek word praltes. And it, this is a very difficult word to translate. In fact, if, if you go look at your translation, some will call this gentleness. It's translated gentleness a lot. It's translated meekness. And, and, I, and that word meekness is, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't like that word because it, for us, we, we, we see this timid little mouse, right? In English, when we use the word uh, timid, it's like they're just a, they're a coward. They, they don't have any courage. But that's not what that word means at all. In fact, I looked this up. In the Greek, secular Greek, that word is used to describe Alexander the Great's horse. Alexander the Great had a horse named Bucephalus. And he was this stallion, that just huge stallion, taller than anybody else's horse. Nobody could ride him. Alexander was the only one that could, could ride him. And he would go into battle. And, it, and they wrote books about him. They call him the most famous horse in the world. 
And, and it's just incredible. You've got this creature that is just magnificent and beautiful and strong and courageous, yet it willingly submits to its master. See, that's what, that's what James is saying. You, you are a human being. You are an incredible creation. You have beauty and value and, and all of these things, but yet receive with meekness. Submit yourself voluntarily to the Word. I just love that. It, it pictures a strength that's under control. You see, James is obviously here picturing someone who is yielding and submitting to the Holy Spirit in their life. Someone who deliberately places themselves under divine authority. The opposite of this is you don't, you don't receive the Word with suspicion. You know, the devil's always, he's got the same trick that he did with Eve. He came into Eve and, and Eve said, yeah, he told us not to do that. And he said, yeah, because he's got ulterior motives. You know, he knows that when you eat that, you're going to be like him. We don't receive the word with suspicion. We certainly don't receive it with arrogance, like we know better than him. We don't receive it with anger and push back against it because it's, it, 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 it's, it's calling into question our lifestyle and by the way, we don't do it partially. We don't treat it like the golden corral. I'll take this part, but then that part, but I don't like that. No, you take it all. That's what it means. Warren Wiersbe said this, When you receive the word with meekness, you accept it, you don't argue with it, and you honor it as the word of God, and you don't try to twist it to conform it to your thinking. You don't try to twist it to conform it to your thinking or your lifestyle. You accept it as the word of God. That's what it means to receive it with meekness. Now, we get to the last part of this, and this is my favorite part. If you'll do that, if you'll put off the moral filth in your life, you'll put aside the, the wickedness in your life, and you'll receive the Word. You'll, you'll willingly submit to the Word. James says it is able to save your soul. Now, Let's read it so we can all see it. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now, I want to cover something real quick <clears throat> because I do this ever so often. I think most preachers do. You have to. Because most people, when you say, when, you say when did you get saved, we'll all point back to some time, right? We'll all look back in history and say, oh, I was saved when I was 11, or I saved when I was 40, or whatever the case may be. But the Bible actually teaches salvation in three different tenses. Here's the first one. Scripture teaches us, as we just said, that we have been saved already. For example, Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved. When was that? That's past tense, right? That's in the past. You've already been saved through faith. That's not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You can also see that in Titus 3.5 and 1 Timothy 1.9. Now listen, this is a beautiful thing. At the moment you believed, at the moment you put your faith in Christ, God justified you and declared you righteous. Paul says in Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified or made right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, think about some of the things that happened to you at the moment of salvation. You were cleansed of all your guilt. You were forgiven of all your sins. You were absolved from the penalty of eternal death. You were born again. You were clothed in Christ's righteousness. You were freed from condemnation, and you were made eternally safe in Christ. And I could go on and on and on and on and on of all the things that happened to you when you were born again in the past. But yet, Scripture also teaches us that we are being saved. That it's happening right now. For example, 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are, say it with me, being saved. It is the power of God. You can also find that in 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Corinthians 2, and 2 Corinthians 3. So it teaches us that we're being saved right now. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's the thing. When we were saved in the past, we were saved from the penalty of sin. But can we all be honest? We all still struggle with the power of sin in our life today, don't we? 
See, we're forgiven, but we ain't perfect. See, while we're still on this earth, when he says we are being saved, what he's doing is he's saying we are being saved from the power of sin. We, it, it, the Spirit is remaking us, and we're putting off this, this moral filth and evil, uh, or this rampant evil that sent us. We are being saved. We are being made whole, even while we are here. Scripture calls this sanctification. It's the process of being saved from the power and dominion of sin as we allow the Spirit and Christ to live His life through us. 1 John 3.3 3 speaks of this, and all who have this eager expectation, and he's talking about to see Him. In fact, 1 John 3.2 says this, we don't, know, we don't really know what's going to happen, John says, but we know this, when we see Him, we will be like Him. Now watch what he just says. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure. If, that's, if you are born again, if you are really, truly, genuinely saved, and you're looking to one day, I'm going to see Jesus, and between, there is a goal in your mind, and that is to keep myself pure for that day. And the Spirit is doing that in us through the Word. But here's the other thing. Scripture also teaches that we shall be saved in the future. So it teaches that we have been saved in the past, we're being saved in the present, and we will be saved in the future. Romans 5.10 For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall, say it with me, be saved by His life. That's also taught in Romans and by uh, Peter in his first letter. Scripture, by the way, describes this as glorification. That beautiful day when we see him as he is, when we become like him, on that day we will be fully free from the presence of sin. 1 John 3.3, 3, uh, it should be 3.2, I'm sorry. Beloved, I just said it, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Let me tell you, one day we'll get a new body. This flesh, this baggage that we brought into the Christian life, will be gone. And we get a complete new body. Not only that, we will live on a new earth. This earth is gone. God will recreate a new earth. We'll live on that earth with new bodies. And God himself will come down and live with us. It's an unbelievable thing, almost, that, that what we've been called to. And on that day, the sin nature will be completely eradicated. By the way, we can't even imagine it. Can you ever, I heard somebody say, well, won't we be jealous in heaven when that guy gets more rewards than us? And the answer is no. You'll be like, yeah, man, you are awesome. Because you love, it's like our children. I want my children. I, I'm not jealous when my children get rewards. That, that's weird. I love it when they're praised. I love it, those kind of things. What if we loved everybody the way we love our children? What if, what if somebody got something and you're like, man, there's, there's no jealousy. None of that. It's all gone. Can you, can you imagine it? No. You can't. You can't even imagine what it's going to be like to live in that new body. But let me tell you, we will struggle with it no more. You'll struggle with sin no more. So we have been saved from the penalty of sin. That's justification. We are being saved from the power of sin. That's sanctification. We shall be saved from the presence of sin. That's glorification. It's a beautiful thing what he's doing. So when James says the implanted word is able to save your souls, let me tell you, he's looking at all that. He's not just looking back. He's saying, man, he's already saved you by the implanted word. He's going to free you now from the power of sin. He's saving you. He's making you whole. And one day he's going to bring you to glory. The word is going to guard you and he's going to keep you until that day. You see, for Christians, listen, every day should be a salvation day. We don't have to, you know, I hear people say, and, and I, I, there's nothing wrong. We should all have a, if, if you will, an altar Somewhere in our life where we gave our heart to Christ. I'm not nothing wrong with that. But folks, you better not depend on it. I'm saved because I know I'm saved today. Not because I, I did something uh, uh, 50 years ago. I'm saved because I know right now 
I love Jesus, and I love the Word, and I, and I want to submit. I know all these things are in my life today. That's what you need to be looking at. See, for us, every day should be a salvation day. Here's a poem written by somebody we know. It says, off with the old and on with the new. And by the way, this is written about James 1.21. It says, off with the old and on with the new. God's word tells me exactly what to do. Laying aside the filthy and sinful part, I can have a clean, pure heart. Blessed in all my ways, his word to receive so my actions can line up with what I believe. If I hold on to the world in the past, I will not last. But if in God's word I stay, this will be another salvation day. Some guy named Henry Jones wrote that. All right, listen to me close. If you ain't heard anything else I said, I need you to wake up. You and I need to understand something. There is no plan B. There is no plan B. I, I want you to picture for me, in just a moment, a man who's in danger of losing his life. Maybe he's drowning, maybe he's hanging on the side of a mountain, whatever. But he's, he's, he's going to die unless somebody comes and saves him. Okay? You got that in your mind? And so the rescuers show up. And there's, these are professionals. They know what they're doing. But instead of following their instructions, instead of doing what they tell him to do, he fights against them. When they say, do this, he, he does the opposite. When, it, when they say, do that, he does something else. He, he fights against everything they tell him to do. Now, let me, can we all agree that's the wrong way to be saved? That's pretty obvious, right? You see, what he should do is submit to their commands. Because they're professionals. He should assume that they, they know what they're doing. That they're, they're trying to save his life. And even if he don't know them, listen, after all, at the end of the day, there is only hope. Right? Without them, he's going to die. So, so submit to them. Here's the thing, guys. God's plan is to save your soul through his word. God's plan is to save your soul through his implanted word. First, by giving you a new birth, but by using the word every single day to keep you and guard you and guide you and discipline and make absolutely sure that you make it to the end. That's the plan. That's God's plan. There ain't no plan B. There is no plan where you start out really good and halfway through you say, you know what, I don't need that word anymore. And you walk away. I don't see that plan anywhere in the Bible. There's only one plan. Born again by the word, you receive the implanted word, you're kept by the word until you are glorified. That's God's plan. There ain't no plan B. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, 13, the one, read it with me, you know it, who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures to the end will be saved. This past Sunday, for those of you that were here, and if you weren't, I, I would encourage you to, to listen. Pastor Henry, and I don't often do this. I don't, I, in fact, I can't remember the last time I did. He preached a sermon out of Hebrews chapter 6. And uh, the sermon was called Moving Beyond the Foundation. And it was a great sermon. Again, it's online. I encourage you to listen to it. Um, I'm going to read those verses. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. This is Paul writing, and he says this, Let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instructions about baptism. You don't need more instructions about laying on of hands. You don't need more instructions about the, the, uh, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. He, he's saying we need to move on from that. And he says, and God willing, we will move forward. You remember what I said God's plan was? God's plan is to save you with the Word of God. But then His plan is you to move forward in the Word of God. And this is what He's talking about. But there's people in the church that just go round and round the same mountain over and over and over. And they never leave the basics of the faith. 
And, and Pastor Henry did a marvelous job of encouraging us to move beyond that. But this week, I was reading, I was thinking about that, and I read it, and I read the next verses. And we didn't get a chance to read these verses Sunday. But I want you to look at the next verses. For it, now, by the way, that word for is a connecting word. Does everybody understand that? It connects what he's about to say with what he just said. Now watch what he says. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the age to come, and then who turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. For by rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing Him to the cross once again and holding Him up to public shame. And then Paul says, Dear friends, even though we are talking this way, we don't really believe this applies to you. We are confident that you are meant for better things, things that come with salvation. So I want you to watch what Paul did. Paul says, look, you need to move on. You need to move on. You just keep staying at the same spot in your Christian life and going around the same mountain. And, and then he says, and understand, if you fall away, you ain't coming back. That's what he said. You ain't coming back. It's impossible. It, it reminds me, and you've heard the joke, the boy, little boy falls out of bed. And they said, why'd you fall out of bed? He said, because I stayed too close to where I got in. Let me tell you, some of you are too close to where you got in. And it is dangerous. That's what Paul is writing to them. If, if you're one of those people and you haven't moved on, you haven't received the implanted word, and you're not maturing, he's telling them, listen, listen guys, that's a problem. Something is, something's wrong. Something is very, very wrong. And he wants them to see the danger of that position. So here tonight, I'm going to remind you of what Paul reminded the Corinthian church. Listen to what he said. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. You see, what the Word is teaching us, folks, is that true faith, people who are truly born again, are born again by the Word. The Word is engrafted inside of them, and then they're going to receive that Word just like we're doing right here, and they're going to grow, and they're going to grow, and they're going to mature, and they're going to grow, and all the way to glory. They don't turn back. They don't walk away. They don't stop receiving their Word. There is no plan B. That's the plan. And so Paul warns us, warns us, just as the writer of Hebrews did. Be very careful. Be very careful. If you're those, and you're just, you're, you're at the basics, you just can't seem to move on. If you're not putting off the filth, there's real danger in where you stand. So let me tell you, welcome God's Word into your life. Don't fight against it. Don't be suspicious of it. Don't push it away. Welcome it into your life because if you're born again, that means it has saved you, saved you, it is saving you, and it will save you if you continue to receive and you continue to obey it. I got a quick plug, and then we're going to pray. I don't, uh, and, and we're going to do a quick altar call here tonight. I don't, you know, guys, I don't normally do that. But I feel like this is one of those passages that needs a response. And I, let me tell you, there's everybody here should respond to this passage, to be quite honest with you. We all could do a better job of receiving the Word, right? But if you're here tonight and, and you're one of those and you've, just, you've been in church for a long time and you've, you've, you know, you've been around it for a long time, but yet the fact is you're not mature. You're not where you should be. You're still around the basics, the fundamentals, the foundations. By the way, those are important, as Pastor Henry said. You can't grow without them. You need a foundation. 
But we should be building walls, putting up trusses, putting on roofs, going to the second stories and third stories and fourth stories. We should be building mansions by now, and yet we're still sitting on the foundation. That's a problem. That's a real dangerous, dangerous problem. If you're here tonight and you're a man, uh, we are having a men's conference this weekend. Uh, It's Friday night and Saturday morning. Um, we're going to serve uh, dinner uh, Friday night at 6. We're going to be here for a couple of hours. We're going to have worship and testimony. And then Saturday morning, we're going to serve breakfast at 8. We're going to have some teaching, some really good teaching, um, some good fellowship, some, some good worship. And uh, let me tell you, I, I, this is one of those opportunities, right? It's an opportunity as a man to take a big step forward. Maybe you've been running in place for a long time. It's time to take that step forward, and this weekend is an opportunity uh, to do that. You can sign up on the app. You can sign up on that little big white thing out in the lobby, whatever that is. Um, Feel free to to do that. Listen, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you tonight if you would like to respond to the Word of God. If you want to respond to the Word of God, then as I pray, if you will, everybody, if you will, just stand with me. As I pray, just come find you a place uh, here at the altar and just, just see me. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said in the parable of the sower, sometimes the word is sowed out and the birds come and eat it immediately. They come and eat it immediately. It never takes root. And, that's, and he says that's the enemy doing that. Let me tell you, the word has been sown here tonight. The call has gone out to move forward in your Christian walk. Don't let the enemy steal it. Get that in your heart and say, I will do this. Let's pray. Father, oh Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. What an incredible, incredible, incredible word that it is. God, for those of us here that are born again, I just want to give you the glory. I want to give you the honor, Holy Spirit, for what you did. You opened our eyes. You you let us see the Word where before we had rejected the Word, before we thought it was foolishness, but somehow you opened our eyes and let us see it as the most beautiful thing we've ever seen. That's on you. That's on you, Holy Spirit. I give you the glory for that. Now, Father, for those that are in this body that have the Word implanted, I pray, God, for a new spirit of submission in their life, a, a new spirit of meekness, a, a spirit that's that, that they walk in courage like, like, uh, uh, like uh, Alexander's horse. They're, they're, they've got value and they're beautiful and they've got courage and they're warriors, but yet they submit to the Holy Spirit. They submit to the Holy Spirit when they receive His Word. God, give us that spirit. Give us that spirit of meekness and gentleness and submission and teachability in this church because you do that, God, and it will change everything. I thank you for the men and women that come out on Sunday, that come out on Wednesday night, that go to life groups who are doing their part to hear the Word of God. But Holy Spirit, let's be honest, all that stuff inside, that's you. That's you. So we pray for submission to you. We pray for meekness toward you. We we pray for a love for you, ability to hear you, God. Oh, Lord, move in on our behalf. And, Father, I pray if there's anyone here tonight, and they heard it, they heard it, and they were convicted because they know deep in their heart that they're not moving. They know they're not moving, that they've just been at the same spot, stuck for so long. God, will you help them see the danger? Will you help them tonight? Will you make it clear to them the type of danger that they are in because there is no other plan. There is no other plan. And I pray, Father, if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't know you and that they're not sure about their salvation, that before they walk out of these doors tonight, that they'll come find me. They'll come find Pastor Henry or Pastor Bill or Pastor Chuck, and they'll make sure that they're right with God before they walk another step. I pray, God, that somebody, somehow, some way, their journey to glory will start right here, right now. Father, we love you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank, I, I'm so sorry for the times that we ignore you. Jesus said it was better for him to go away so you could come. Because you're in every single one of us. You're, doing, you're, you're working in every single one of us. And how much do we ignore you? How much do we forget to talk to you? How much do do we forget to do those things? Forgive us of that, Holy Spirit. And we ask you to move tonight in River of Life. We ask you to move in individual hearts and souls on this night. 
And Father, we will love you and we'll thank you. We pray for this weekend. We pray for the men that are going to come out Friday night and Saturday night. God, we've done our best to plan something and to do the best we can. Now you take over. You, you do what you do. You do something supernatural. Because if you don't, it'll just be a nice dinner. If you don't, it'll just be a, an entertainment. God, we don't want that. We want something life-changing. We want something supernatural. We want to see men this weekend move off the foundations and move forward in their walk with you. God, do, will you do that? Will you do that, Lord? We agree together. And I promise you, I promise you, Father, we will give you all the glory and all the honor and all the power and all the praise because it all belongs to you. We ask all this in your precious, precious son's name. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. You are dismissed. Thank you again for watching our message from River of Life. If this message has touched you today, or if you need someone to pray with, please contact our office at 850-926-1200 or email us at info at rolcrawfordville.com. We also want to encourage you to visit us Sunday mornings at 1030 or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Please visit us at rolcrawfordville.com for more information and directions.